Thank you. So um, I actually did, I did tell uh, my friend at the RAC yesterday about your experience. Um, and he's, he's fed that back to his team, so he was, he was very pleased. But um, yeah, that's good. Um, cool. All right. So uh, when, you, when you go to the training that you do that teaches you how to work from the front of a room and, and do presentations, what they uh, suggest that you do is spend the first half an hour of the session um, talking about your background. Are you guys cool if we skip that bit and just get straight into the content? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thought you might say that. Um, so, so what I'll do is I'll give you examples of, of, the, of the content um, and really the examples and the stories will give you some insight into my background. So you'll find out about my background, but it'll be in the context of the stories uh, which will be relevant to the content. So, so I, I find that's a, a more relevant and engaging way to, uh, to do it. Cool, so today is really about how you can convert more of the inquiries that you get into paying clients. So I'm gonna give you a number of different levers that you can pull to make that happen. And it's going to be specifically around the actual process that the client goes through with you from the very moment that they contact your organisation to the moment that they either say yes or no, but the system that I'm going to teach you will allow you to do that in a more elegant way. So the main reason I started doing this is that I was always, there was two things, I was always really impressed with people that could, that in, my, in the sales roles that I had, people that could create a, a, a buying environment and do that in a really elegant, non-abrasive way. So that, that always impressed me. And what always got my back up were, were the, the, the exposure to business people that were really quite aggressive in their approach. So if you can create an environment where your client wants to work with you, where you've uncovered value enough for them to say, well, yes, this looks like an opportunity, I'd like to go ahead, and you can do that artfully and elegantly, then to me, that's, a, that, that's the utopian outcome. So that's kind of the lens through which I, I, I see this whole business development process that I'm going to share with you. Does that make sense? Cool. Awesome. Um, who's ever had any sales training before? Yeah? Who hasn't? Okay, gotcha. Uh, what, what have you done? Gotcha. How long ago was that? <laughs> 15 years? Yeah, gotcha. And? Oh, got it. There you go. Your face does look vaguely familiar. <laughs> There's been a few moons since then because I was in Mal's group as well. Cool. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do is that the, the, if, you do, if you do a Google search for, for sales techniques, there's about 172 million pages <laughs> that you've got access to. So this is one system that I have road tested uh, on myself. So I'm, I'm my own biggest lab rat as it relates to testing all this stuff. And I've taught it to dozens and dozens of different businesses in many, many different industries, and uh, it, I've you know, seen it work over and over and over again. I'm going to give you some examples of that as we go through. So, so why do we need a sales process? So out of interest, who, who has a, a sales process in the room? Put your hand up if you, if you have a sales process. Yeah? Um, put your hand up if you don't. Okay, gotcha. So here's the, here's the thing. Even if you feel like you don't have one, there actually is one but it's probably just not one that, that is, that is uh, within your awareness or one that's particularly documented. So, so you probably do have one, um, but if you don't think you do, then there's probably room for improvement. Would that be accurate? Yeah, cool. So why do we need a, a sales process? Well, in the absence of having a sales process, what most salespeople do is, or what most business owners do, 
is they will go into what I call product dump mode. And product dump mode is really just at the earliest possible opportunity within a sales conversation, they just start talking about their product. And uh, these days, what, one of the most powerful tools that I've got access to as it relates to coaching business people around their sales process is listening to their telephone conversations. And I am blown away at how many times I'll listen to a sales conversation and within like two minutes of the beginning of the conversation, the business owner or the salesperson will just start talking about their product or service. Um, and it, it cuts off a lot of the opportunity and we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go. But for the most part, one of the biggest, probably the single biggest mistake that, that salespeople make is that they start talking about their product too early in the conversation. So um, product dump mode is, uh, is, is not a, a positive thing or a useful thing as it relates to a sales process. And what that means is that you get roller coaster results. In fact, what you tend to find is that most people are buying in spite of the sales process, not because of it. So the, the actual sales process becomes an impediment to somebody making a buying decision rather than something that is actually facilitating a buying decision. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Um, and what, what can also often happen is that you become too reliant on one person. So often that one person is the business owner. So the business owner is really good at, at, at the process and there's nobody else in the organisation that can do the same type numbers as what they can. And so what happens is that, that, that the business owner tends to spend all their time in a sales role because they need to, to keep the, keep the figures up. And what's the cost of that? What, what happens if, if the person who's meant, to be, who's meant to be growing the business or working on the business is working in the business doing all the sales? What, what's, the, what's the drama with that? Someone tell me. Zero growth. Yeah, zero growth because they can't focus on growing the business and doing the sales at the same time. So that can often be a really big drama. They're too reliant on one person or they've got one really good salesperson within the team but if you ask the business owner, what do you reckon that guy's doing to get really good results? Guess what the answer will be? No idea. I have absolutely no idea whatsoever, <laughs> right? And so that business, that, that, that salesperson leaves, what happens? Yeah, they, go, they, they fall into a massive hole. So it, it's a, it can be a very risky type endeavour um, you know, if, if all of the, the, the sales process IP is resting within one person's head. Um, and what that ultimately means is that you can't grow. So what you want is proper diagnostics. And by proper diagnostics, what is also really valuable with having proper diagnostics is that you can disqualify people who aren't a fit. Do you want to work with every single inquiry that you get in your organisation? Do you? No, of course not. Because there are some people that do not represent an opportunity. So often one of the things that, that uh, is, 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 is the most valuable part of the process that I help people to implement in their business is helping them to disqualify people that they shouldn't be talking to. Because if you're going out and seeing somebody on site or at their business, or uh, if, if you're a little bit further on and you've got a salesperson that you're putting in a car and sending out to see somebody, the, the average cost of doing that for, for like a full-time employee, a car, their time there and back, the average cost of that um, across the different businesses that I've worked with can be anywhere from $300 to $400. So you want to make sure that that person's qualified. So often there's a qualification part at the front end before we even have the actual sales conversation itself. Um, and so what that will give you is more consistent results. So one of the best ways to increase your conversion rate is to actually um, only talk to people that have actually got a high percentage of converting and making sure that we qualify them first before we go and see them. So we can like, you know, create massive shifts in people's conversion just through talking to people that are better qualified. Um, and what that means is that everyone's winning. And especially if you're going to employ somebody, so often people you know, they want a sales process, but they want a sales process that they can put in front of someone who has the right attitude and that they can get a predictable result with. 
So the, the utopian outcome is that if you're going to employ somebody to do sales, and I see this mistake all the time, so people will employ somebody, six months down the track they still haven't made a sale. So if you're going to employ somebody to do sales, you want to make sure that your process, your induction process, the sales process that you've got, allows that person to, within a predictable amount of time, normally, you know, hopefully, within the first 60 to 90 days, they are making sales. Because if they are making sales within 60 to 90 days, they, are, they have a feeling of winning, and if they have a feeling of winning, they will continue to stay. If, if it's three months down the track and they haven't made a sale, what's gonna happen, do you think? Yeah, they'll leave. They want that they'll leave. So a good process is one that you can put someone with the right attitude. So obviously induction's a massive part, like picking the right person. But someone with the right attitude, you put them in front of that process. They can start kicking goals within a a specific uh, frame uh, time time frame, as it relates to your induction process. Um, and what that means is that you can scale. You can scale. So often one of the biggest roadblocks is I, I'm not confident to employ more salespeople because I'm not confident that I have a process that they can get a predictable result with. So once you've got that in place, you can start to scale your business. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is what we call the conversion ladder. So the way this works is that you've got a couple of different levels. So down the bottom, there are businesses out there with no sales process. And as a general rule of thumb, you can expect between five, actually, let me just double check that. But there, there, there are actual businesses out there that have got no sales process whatsoever. So you can expect a five to 10% conversion rate if you have no sales process in your business. The level above that is, there is a sales process, and that doesn't have two ends in it. Um, ineffective. So that can give you between 10 and 15% conversion. The level above that is where you have a generic sales process, and that'll give you somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 30% conversion rate. I'll explain what these levels are in a sec. The level above that is where you've got something that is structured. And that can deliver you somewhere in the, in the vicinity of 30 to 60%. And then up the top, if you continue to prove, test, and refine your sales process, you can get upwards of between 60 and 90%. So down here, it's, it's, th th there's no sales process at all. So each person that deals with a new client is going to deal with them totally differently. They are going to have a very different experience uh, regard, uh, in, in direct proportion to who they work with, right? So it's a different experience. Um, and it's not documented. So the level above that is where, so often the, you know, the, the fairly typical scenario is I walk into a business and I'll say, do you have a sales process? And they'll say, uh, yeah. And I'll say, okay, so can you, know, can you tell me more about it? And they'll say, yeah, 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 it's in that manual um, over there. And I go, when was the last time that you or anyone else in this organisation actually looked at that? And they'll, then they'll say, oh, well, um, the new guys are meant to look at it when they first start. And then I'll say, is that happening? And they'll go, don't know. <laughs> right? That, so that's typically where that, where that sits. Generic is, well, we went and saw... Jordan Belfort, or we went and saw a Tom Hopkins thing ages ago, or someone read a book and, and adapted that to our business, um, and that's going to give you a generic type process. But then the level above that is where it starts to become relevant for that specific business. 
So we've taken into consideration the level of qualification of the person that's, that's actually coming to see you. We've taken into consideration the context in which the conversation's having, uh, in, in which, in which, um, in which the conversation is taking place. We've taken into consideration the product itself, the industry, the market, and, it, and we've, we've actually got something that's, that's more relevant to the business. And then this is what happens when you continue to test it, when you continue to say, okay, well, what's working? What needs to change? Where, you know, where's the drop-off point? Where are the bottlenecks? And we continue to dissolve those by refining the language, by refining the process, by testing different things. Does that make sense? So, um, interested to know, whereabouts are you guys? Bottom. Where, pardon? Bottom. Bottom, yeah. Cool, thanks for sharing. So, who else is here? Okay, who, who's here? Gotcha. Um, that's about, it. so people ask me all the time, so you know, what would be a average conversion rate? It's around about 20, 25%. That's pretty much a, a, a fairly standard type benchmark. Who's above here? We're getting into the structure. Awesome. Yeah. Brilliant. Who's um, here? Gotcha. Awesome. So a bit of a spread. So, so with, with what it is that you'll learn today, there is a really good opportunity to make some shifts here. Um, and there's some other levers that we can pull, um, but it's, it's always good if we're going to address something to, to look at where we're at currently. So, um, so Kelly is a really good example of someone who was doing most of the sales. So she has an a online weight loss program for busy mums. So it's called, you know, busy mums weight loss or something. And she was doing most of the sales and she was convinced that she would never find anyone that could do the same level, the same conversions as what she was doing on the phone. So she had, at that point, three girls that were working for her that were all taking um, calls. So she was spending a lot of money on, on, on advertising on Facebook. And they were all getting around about between 20 and 25% conversion. So we went through their process. We, made a, we, we created a customized process that was that was really a standard procedure that all of those girls used when they got an inquiry. And we got the girls up to 45%, which meant that Kelly could stop doing sales, but more importantly, it gave her the confidence to be able to hire some more people. And they are, they are now all getting around about between 35 and 45% conversion. Um, and so um, that, that was, so she went from 50 clients every two weeks to 50 clients in four days. So that's a really significant shift. That was a message that she sent me on Facebook. Um, so um, this one is pretty cool. So uh, looking at uh, Nunzio's sales process, he owns a music school. So we did a couple of other things with Nunzio, um, but we increased his enrolments uh, by 60%. Um, and that was for that particular term. So he had a 60% shift in his enrolments term on term, and we increased his conversions from 35 to 48%. Um, so that was pretty cool. Anyone know Nunzio? Yeah, he's a good, good fella. He, um, so he's, he, uh, Forte's a, a, a franchise, uh, but what we also did is we put together like a kind of a belt system within his uh, music school to increase his, his uh, retention. So that they would have, you know, it was like, you know, the entry level was like maestro and then the level above that was, <laughs> it was kind of cool. So everyone would have a badge that showed the level of competency that they were at. So it became a bit of a, a ladder of ascension within the business. Yellow belt, green belt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like that, but for a music school. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. Um, and this is an awesome one. So this is Jenny. Um, number of levers that we pulled here, but really staggering um, shift in her results. She went from 104K per month to 384K. Um, and that was through better qualification at the front end. So she stopped sending um, her designers out to go and see people that didn't represent an opportunity. Uh, we worked on her, so we worked on a qualification process at the front end. We worked on the, on the actual conversation, the initial site visit that happened when the person rocked up on site to the person's home. And we also worked on the presentation process where she went to present the plan back to the client. So 
those are the three big levers that we pulled, um, and and that you know that's a that's a staggering result. So. Um, Yes. Which was the number of quotes they did and the number of sales they did and the, the conversion rate. Yep. I don't know of many who would actually say with a high degree of certainty that, oh, it's one in 3.7 or one in yes. 2 point whatever. And so um, I don't know whether you're going to go into that sort of conversion stuff. Well, I mean, it's certainly worth tracking. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. If, if, if it's like anything. If you start to track it, you'll, you can start to monitor it and, and you can look at where you're at and look at what you want to... I mean, that, that, that's primarily where the conversion ladder comes in. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, where, where, where do you think you are? Yeah. Um, and, and I guess, you know, the, the, the next question is, well, what would happen if you doubled that? Because if you're, if, if you're at 30% or below, there, there is an opportunity to double your conversion. And there's a number of levers that we can pull to do that. Um, but, but often it... Sorry, we can... Know what your conversion rate is. We we don't actually have the ratio, but we've got all the figures. Yes. We could calculate that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not something that's it's not one of the KPIs up on the board. The actual yeah. conversion rate. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, well, and we have uh, uh, Andrew has a high conversion rate. <coughs> you wouldn't know what it is in percentage to no. no. I think we're just trying to get that. Yeah. yeah. But so if if it's sixty and you can get it to 75, then you can say, well, I'm getting 20 customers a month, and it's 60%, if I get it to 75%, how many more customers? Yeah, I mean, my, my, one of my favorite examples of this is my wife's business. So she had a opportunity to buy a weight loss and nutrition clinic, knowing absolutely nothing about weight loss and nutrition, right? So this is how qualified she was. She used to own a restaurant in Sydney, <laughs> right? So she, went, she purchased this business knowing absolutely nothing about weight loss and nutrition. When she bought it, the, the business uh, broker that she spoke to said that it was a business that ran on its own, right? So they, and they did have a lot of the processes in place. So they had a script for the in incoming inquiries. Most of their leads were coming from Google AdWords and they were converting 40%. And there was a girl that was doing the sales when Tanya bought the business, but after a while she left. And so it was like, okay, well now Tanya has to do the sales. So we looked at the process and we improved it. So they had a script, we looked at it, we improved it, and Tanya now gets, on average, somewhere in between 60 and 90% conversion, which is pretty significant. I mean, some weeks, you know, some months, you know, two or three months will go by and she's getting 90% conversions, which is, which is pretty significant. Now, Tanya always makes me tell everybody that she's actually a good salesperson, <laughs> right? So she goes, you can't take all the credit for that. I'm already good at sales. Okay, I'll make sure I tell that. <laughs> but the, 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 big, the, the big test came when we taught Bridget, who works for Tanya, to do sales as well. And Bridget is also getting in between 60 and 80%. So not as, not, not, not as consistent or as high as Tanya, but certainly significantly higher than the 40% that we've got. So the process that we built not only works for someone who's actually good at sales, who people know is the business owner, because that, that carries some weight, it also works for somebody else who's using the same process. Um, so, so there are some significant shifts you know, when, we, when we really do start to put some focus on this. So what I'm gonna do now is walk you through the, the, the framework that I use to build these processes for people. So, so there are, there's some language and some, some, some phraseology and, and some things that will work for you in here. And then the step beyond that is where we go, okay, well, how do we, how do we really customize it for you? But with what I will share with you today, you know, people like, um, like Rob, um, and the other gentleman that, um, that John mentioned, or was that the same person? There's a couple. There's a, oh, there's a couple. Brilliant. Yes. Have, have you know, created significant shifts through simply seeing this presentation alone. So 
Um, it would certainly be my, um, my goal for you to, and, and my wish for you, for, for you to get the same type um, uh, situation. So, um, so to start off with, we have, we, in, in fact, what I'll do is I'll walk you through the overall process and then we'll drill down into the actual specifics of each part of the process. So, so STRIKE stands for the following. So it stands for situation, troubleshooting, troubleshoot, uh, result, impact, kickstart, and enroll. So situation is where we need to acknowledge the context. So context is, is massive in a sales conversation. And so what I mean by context is you're talking, so scenario is you're talking to somebody and you say to them, so, you know, so how did you guys, you know, find out about us? Or, um, you know, what made you decide to give us a call? So scenario one, they say, oh, I Googled uh, home inspections and, and your name came up, all right? That's scenario number one. Scenario number two, so, you know, what made you decide to give us a call? Well, uh, my brother used you guys and he said that if I used anyone else, I would be an absolute idiot, <laughs> right? So which one is, is, is more qualified? Second one, yeah. So, so this is happening all the time. We need to understand the situation and the context in which the conversation is taking place because that will determine to a large extent, how we actually process that particular, that particular um, inquiry. So, so there's a couple of stages in there which we'll get stuck into in a sec. So troubleshoot, what we need to do there is we need to understand the motivation or the actual problem behind what it is that the person has come to us for. So we need to understand what, what is the motivation for this purchase or what is the problem that we are solving? Another way of saying this is we need to create an environment where the person expresses a goal to us or a, a, a specific outcome that they are looking to achieve through your particular product or service. Make sense so far? Yep. Um, so then result is where we need to flip that and go, okay, well, you know, what would be the ideal outcome of, of making this happen? What are the two or three things that would need to happen for uh, this to be a good result for you? Then the, the, the part after that is the impact because people buy a product or service, but what they really want is, the, is what their world will look like with that particular product or service in place or the result of what that particular product or service has created. So, um, so, you know, straight off the top of my head, I want to, uh, I want to hire a landscaper to do my backyard. So what am I buying? I'm buying landscape services, I'm buying some retaining walls, I'm buying some days of labour and some plants. What do I really want? I want a place that I can hang out with my family that's going to be a really beautiful place that, you know, that we can be together as a family. That's, that's the outcome. What's the level above that? Well, maybe it's being a good provider or you know, um, feeling like a, you know, like a great parent or something like that. So, so there's, there's what we buy and there's the result that it, that it creates, but then there's you know, what, what's the real impact of that? What's the before and after? And then from there, once we've gone through this particular process, uh, and, and only here, is where we actually start to make a recommendation as to what product or service that we would recommend to actually make this happen. 
to fix this and make this happen. So here is where we, is, is where we kick start the solution. And then enrol is simply enrolling them in the next step of your process. So depending on what you sell, there might be a couple of different stages of your process. Enrol simply sells the next stage of your process. So as an example, if someone inquires, I have a conversation with them on the phone, and the next step is for me to go out and visit them in their home, or the next step is for us to catch up um, for a conversation either on the phone or face to face. All the initial conversation does is sells the next step of the process. So all each step of the process does is sell the next step of the process. So turn to the person next to you and ask them, what part of that, what part of the strike process do you feel like you need more help with or that you should that you need to spend more time focused on? Okay, so what what part of the strike process do you feel like you need either one, more help with, or two, you need to spend more time focused on? Okay, quick, quick conversation with the person next to you. Oh, that, that, that's where we kickstart our solution. We kickstart our solution. You do all that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I do as well, but I think yeah. Okay, one more minute on that, one more minute. <laughs> Okay, 30 seconds. Okay. All right. So, which part? Which part do you think that you would need to either spend more time focused on or need more help with? The Got it. Yeah. And and as we'll talk about, that's that really is the. It's it's it really is the crucial part. It, it, it is actually where a transaction takes place in the mind of the person that you're talking to. So we'll, we'll, I'll we'll talk more about that as we get stuck into the actual each step of the process. But um, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Who else? I'd be the same, but also to convert the emotional quality, yeah, that emotional uh, result. Correct. Correct. So there's there's two sides of that coin. So we'll, we'll, again, we'll. We'll talk specifically about that. Um, who else had those? Who, who else had troubleshooting or you know the emotional upside? Yep, great. Um, anyone else have anything different? I yeah. was just going to say we probably like I'm the the salesperson. Yes. I probably don't spend quite as much time on the first 
three or four as maybe I could do. Yes. So yeah, not one in particular, but it's a case of whilst we do generally cover all of those, yep. the first few are generally skipped through a bit more rapidly than they could be. Yep. And I think that's where the time needs to be spent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I it's go straight to the product. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely no accident at all that we don't t start talking about our solution until we get to here. So really, you know, it should be probably, you know, 60, 40 or 70, 30 in terms of what, you know, what happens down here. But for most salespeople, it's the other way around, which is, which is in my experience, a mistake. Um, who else? Yeah. I was more impact. Got it. Just yeah. to transfer of knowledge from myself to the client so they understood what the product is going to do for them. Yes. Got it. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So let's get stuck into it. I'll go, I'm going to give you some specific dialogue around each particular part of the process. Um, so yeah, it's certainly worth taking some notes as we go. So a situation can really be uh, boiled down to creating context. Um, and the best way to do that is to frame the conversation. So what framing does and I'll give you an, a specific example of how to do this in a second, but what framing does is that it, it creates an agenda. It creates an agenda. If you set the agenda, whose agenda is it? Yours. So because it allows you to set an agenda, it allows you to establish some authority and some control over the process. Now, here's the thing. You already have perceived authority by virtue of the fact that you do what you do, you rock up with your shirt on and the embroidered logo on it, regardless of whether you've been doing it for five minutes, five months or five decades, they perceive you as being an authority. So all we need to do is act into that perception because we already have it. A lot of people either don't understand that they have it or they subordinate that, that authority um, unnecessarily when we already have it. So it's important that we live into that. Um, and what it also does is, it, it, if you do it right, it dissolves what we call pitch expectation. So pitch expectation happens when I, I arrive to a conversation that could potentially be perceived as a sales conversation, and I might have some baggage around that. If I've got some baggage around a sales conversation, what is it that I might either be worried about or expecting bad, bad a bad experience yeah what what possibly what you know what might have happened to me in a, in a sales type conversation previously yeah, yeah I got sold something I didn't need or somebody um, exerted lots of pressure on me or was aggressive so people have that baggage so we need to understand that there are going to be a percentage of people and probably a high percentage of people who have had a bad experience with salespeople previously so a good frame will allow us to dissolve that. So an example of a good frame is this. So contextually what's happened, we've, um, the, the person has, you know, we've, we've rocked up for an, for an appointment, we've um, you know, shaken hands, we've created some rapport, or we're on the phone, the person's answered the phone, and we've said, okay, so look, you know, I've got you down to have a quick chat about what you do. So this is the frame. In order for me to work out if or how I can help, I've got some questions to go through with you and then I can make some recommendations one way or another at the end. How does that sound? Right? So that is, that is an example of, of a frame. So in order for me to work out if I can help you, so why would I say in order for me to work out if I can help you or not? Why would I suggest that there's a possibility that I might not be able to help? takes the pressure off. So what's implied by that? That you are looking for the best solution for them. Yes, that I'm looking for the best solution, solution for them. What else is implied by that? There's a lot that's implied by that. Building trust. I'm building trust, yeah. yeah. So to work out if I can help you or not, what else is implied by that? Expertise. Expertise, yeah, yeah. What else? You're not gonna try and sell it? No, I'm not gonna try to sell you at all costs. What is also implied by that? That I'm not what? I'm not pushy. I'm not, I'm not desperate. Right? So, so there's this thing, there's this primal thing that we all have in our brains, which comes from like caveman days, where if we perceive, as, as buyers I'm talking about here, if we perceive even a 
minute amount of neediness in the mind of the person that we are talking to, there is a literally a, like a primal barrier that comes up in our brain. So it's really important that we create an environment where the person doesn't perceive any of that. And also, I mean, this, you know, a lot of this comes down to our own mindset. It's like, you know, do we want to convert all of the people that we talk to? No, we're just looking for the coalition of the willing. We just want the people that we, that, that actually, that we can help, that are interested. And so that's, you know, this, this whole process dovetails into that, that, you know, that mindset, that, that, that common foundation of belief. So in order for me to be able to work out if we can help you or not, I have some questions to go through with you. I'm gonna make some notes as we go, you can add that bit or not. And then I can make a recommendation as to how we might go about this at the end. How's that sound to you? Yep, that sounds great. So definitely worth writing down. Um, I guess it'll be on video too. <laughs> um, so then from there, so we've created the frame. Right, so like anything, if you get the first 15% of something, so if you, the first 15% goes well, what tends to happen with the rest? Flows nicely. You balls, if you balls the first 15% up, what, happened, what tends to happen with the rest? It tends to get worse. <laughs> like, think about, you know, if you have a day that starts off bad, tends to not, not go particularly well. So same thing, if we, if, we get, if we start off on the right foot, then we're all good. So we put a frame around it, we've allowed the person to relax, created an environment where an equal exchange of energy can um, go backwards and forwards, because genuinely we want to work out whether we can help this person or not. So we're saying that up front. Okay, next, troubleshooting. So we need to find out what is the motivation or the problem that we're solving? What is the motivation or the problem that we're solving? So the best way to do that is to ask what I call the core driver question. So the core driver question is this. So what was it, what was it that made you decide, what was it that made you decide to want to catch up today to see if we can help you with your security, to see if we can help you with your IT? to see if we can help you with your building inspections. Insert your thing at the end. Another way of saying this is, so, you know, what made you decide to want to catch up today? Or what I sometimes say is, so out of the 172 million pages on Google that you have to choose from in terms of people that could help you with your sales training, why me? So core driver, there is another way to get this, but this is the quickest way. So there is another way to get this done if they don't give you what you want to the answer to that question. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> it's a reaction or something. Actually, you know what, I'll, I'll share it with you. So, so there is a possibility that if you ask that question, so sometimes they'll tell you, so if you ask that question, so what was it that made you want to catch up today, right? What's the answer, what, what's, what, what are they typically going to hopefully give you as the answer to that question? The problem. Yes, they'll give you what's top of mind, which is the problem. But what is also possible is that they might just start with this massive monologue of information that isn't even remotely useful. So they might start saying, well, look, you know, it all started 10 years ago when my business partner and I, you know, da, 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 and, and, and like you're hearing all this stuff and you're like, why? It's, there's, this is just too much. Like there's nothing that I can really get a hold of. So, so the way that you handle that is, you, is you, you know, w wait for a break. Because <laughs> normally that type of person will talk for a while. So wait for a break in the conversation and then simply say, okay, well, that gives me a really good snapshot of where you're at. Typically, the three biggest problems that clients come to me with that I can solve are they've got this problem, they've got this problem, or they've got this problem. Which of those resonate the most with you? 
So there is, a, there is a particular exercise we do where we work out what are your three, what are the three biggest problems that clients come to you with that you can solve. So we haven't got time to do that exercise today, but that is the other way to, to, to get to the, the actual specific problem. Um, so then once, once they have expressed that problem to you, what we need to do is shine a light on the problem. So if you think about a problem that you've got in your life, it doesn't need to be a business problem, but just a problem in general. If you've got a problem in your life and you think about that problem a lot, what happens to that problem in your head? It gets bigger, right? It gets bigger. So what we need to do is create an environment where the person understands the impact of the problem that they've got. So why would we want to do that? Why would we want to create an environment where the person's expressed a problem to us, but we ask them to explain to us more about what that particular problem is, is creating in their particular world? Why would we want to do that? Pardon? We're listening to their problem and being part of it. Yes, we're listening to the problem, we're being part of it. Why else? We can help them solve it, yep, so we're finding out more about the problem and, and how to specifically solve it. Why else would we want to do that? We'll show an emotional response to them to purchase Yes, so we are, we are looking to create an environment where the impact of not solving the problem becomes greater than the investment in your particular product or service. Does that, does that mean urgency? Yes, urgency yes. So it, it, it creates urgency to solve it, and it also creates motivation. Would you prefer to have a motivated client or an unmotivated client? What would you prefer? Motivated. You want a motivated client. It, because if someone understands the cost of inaction, the cost of doing nothing, then they're gonna be more motivated to do something about it. So if you've, got a, if you've got a product where your client actually has to do something within the process, if they're more motivated to do it, they're gonna give you the information that they need, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be more compliant in the process, they're gonna be easy to deal with. So there's a lot of cool things that can happen if you've got somebody who's motivated. But, but it, so there's a number of strategic outcomes that we can create through simply understanding and helping more, more importantly, as if not more importantly, helping the client to understand the, the actual impact of doing nothing, the cost of inaction. And so, as j just to really sort of crystallise this idea, it's as simple as this, right? So if you are sitting on your couch at home watching television and you can be hung over or not, <laughs> that's, that's your call. It's your couch. It's your couch. <laughs> so if you are sitting on the couch, at what point will you, if you are comfortable on the couch, in the position that you're sitting, at what point will you change positions? I don't mean get up off the couch. At what point will you change positions on the couch? When you're uncomfortable. Yes, when you become uncomfortable enough to do so. So people, humans, will only move when they become uncomfortable enough to do so. So we've got to create an environment where they understand, is this something that's worth doing something about or not? Because if it's not, that's still an okay outcome. Because it allows you to save a lot of time trying to actually work with somebody who's actually not motivated. So, so the whole process is, is simply designed to work out, is this person motivated enough to do something about this or not? So in summary, a purchase takes place first in the mind of our client only when the perceived cost of doing nothing becomes greater than the investment in your product or service. So I'm only going to invest one, the resources, i.e. the money, in working with you, as well as the time and the focus when the impact, when I understand that the impact of doing nothing and the cost of doing nothing is actually greater than the investment in those three things. My time, my resources, and my attention. Most people, when they think about a sales process, they think that the, the operative part is the bit that happens at the end, you know, when you, when, when you close them. It happens here. When most people come to me with a problem with their sales process, they say people aren't converting, they go, oh, my, you know, my guys just aren't closing. They're not closing. It's like, 
the problem's happening way further upstream. People think it happens at the end or that the, that the operative bit is, is, is happening at the end. It's not. It's happening here. That all makes sense to everybody? Yeah, cool. Happy to move on? Yep, great. Um, so, so then, and only then, do we flip to the result. So we go, okay, cool. So what are the three things that you would ideally love to have happen as a result of having this in place? What are the three things that need to happen as a result of having this in place? What would be the three key outcomes that you would be looking for in, in having this particular solution in place? So we've gone from problem to solution. Important that we understand that, there, that there's value in both. So there's value in people understanding the impact of their problem, but then there's also value in me visualising my world with this problem fixed. So they're two sides of the same coin. And then from there, we can go, okay, well, what will that mean? What will that mean for you? Anyone in here deal with middle managers? <coughs> yeah, okay, so it took me years to work this out, but middle managers will do more to either avoid looking bad themselves or to cover their ass than what they will ever do to make a decision that will benefit the, the, the company that they work for. So if you're talking to a middle manager, one of the best questions that you can ask is, so what will this mean for you? Right? They're, buying a, they're, they're buying your product or service, but one of the best questions you can ask them is, so what will this mean for you? Because you want them to buy in to, to the actual positive side of, 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 of having this particular product or service you know, and, and, and it being a good outcome. Because a middle manager starts a role with a particular level of what's called career capital. And whether they finish their tenure within that organisation with more career capital or less career capital will be specifically related to how they invest that career capital while they're with that particular organisation. So investing career capital, an example of investing career capital, is what type of training compliance advisor, external training compliance advisor, will I recommend that my company uses? And if it goes well, that's going to reflect well on me and I'll have more career capital because I've invested it well. If it goes pear-shaped, I'll have less career capital because it ended up being, ended up not going well. So it took me years to work that out. <laughs> Quite middle management a bit clearer. Like, who's middle management? A middle, boss, but not the, the a, a middle manager would be somebody who is not the boss. Yeah. So it's somebody that you've been that, that you've that you've somehow found yourself dealing with around the particular purchase of a product or service. So it's more business, not the owner, but it might be the person we're dealing with in regards to the problem. Perhaps the I, the IT person. Anyway? Yeah, or yeah. HR, yeah. HR. You know, like that. Yeah. That would be an example of a middle manager. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, Correct. They, they have to give Correct. Solution to the yeah. Decision Which is why, wherever possible, if you can start as high as you can and get referred down, yeah. because as, as a middle manager, I'm going to uh, be more likely to talk to you because I've been told to by my middle manager. Whereas if I came into the organisation, my, my um, boss doesn't know about it, and I'm talking to you off my own bat, I'm going to be a lot more guarded in terms of committing to do anything, whereas if my boss told me to talk to you and it goes pear-shaped, it reflects badly on him because he told me to talk to you. But that can be a double-edged sword because often I'll get to the top one who says, oh, this department handles that. Great. They don't understand it. They just know there's a problem in there. Yes. But the problem's been caused by the team that's there. So they're not really au okay about saying they've got a problem or... Well, and our solution will probably take away some of their empire, so they're not that friendly to deal with. No. Well, the, the, the utopian outcome there is if he refers you down to that particular person, preferably in person, but on, on email would be okay. Probably the next best would be on speakerphone. Um, you know, oh, hi, um, 
you know, I'm going to refer you to this particular person, they're going to be in contact in the next couple of days. So now, as a middle manager, I'm talking to you because I've been told to, yes. not off my own bat. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, so then, and only then, do we kickstart a solution. So the best way to, to frame your particular recommendation, your particular solution, is to say, okay, well, based on what you've been saying, or based on what you've told me, what I would recommend is. So again, there's a lot in that dialogue, okay? So based on what you've told me, what, what, what's implied then? Giving them ownership. Giving them ownership, yep. What else? Based on what you've told me, what else is implied? Listen. You listened. Everything that you are about to recommend is being recommended through a lens of what they've just told you. It, 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 it's, it's now a customised solution to me, based on what you've told me. And then what I would recommend is, so very deliberate use of the word recommend, what type of people make recommendations? Experience. Experienced people, yeah. Experience. Experts. Experts. Based on what you've told me, what I'd recommend is. Um, so in between, in between uh, impact and kickstart the solution, there are going to be normally around six questions that relate specifically to your particular product or service. Okay, so I can't tell you what they are because this is the part where we actually workshop those with you to make sure that we're getting all of the information that we need in order to be able to make that, that particular recommendation. So they're gonna be different for each particular product or service. And then the last part is enroll. I believe enroll has two L's. Um, but on this slide, it only has one. Um, so the, the enrol part is, is very simple. And this is the bit where everyone gets all knotted up in, in, in a sales conversation. Everyone gets all you know, weird about how to, how to get some kind of a commitment. And it doesn't need to be like that. So has anyone ever had that experience where you're talking to somebody and you're in a, you know, you're in a conversation with them and then you get to that part where a decision would typically need to happen, and there's that two or three seconds of pregnant silence. Who's ever experienced that? Got it. So here's the thing. Traditional, you know, old school if you want, you know, sales training will say, well, the person who speaks first loses. I don't agree with that at all. And the reason I don't agree with that is because if you follow this process correctly, you, have, you, are, you are essentially guiding them. You've been guiding them right from the very minute that the conversation began. So when we get to the bit where there's silence, there's only silence because they don't know what the next step is. They don't know what your process is. So the best thing that you can say there is, okay, well, what needs to happen next is. And all you do is just explain the next step of the process. Right? So there are, there are sales trainers out there, you know, in, in that 172 million pages out there, that teach 300 different closes. Believe it or not, I teach one. What needs to happen next is. Because all they want to know, and the reason that there's the, the, at those two or three seconds of, uh, is they just don't know what the next step is. So, okay, well look, what needs to happen next is, all you need to do is complete this page here um, and get your card details on there. We can get you set up next week and we can you know, hopefully get this started you know, within the next um, seven to 10 days, but I'll come back to you on the exact start date. How does that sound to you? Okay, if, if, if you have a two, uh, like a, perhaps a two-step process, okay, what needs to happen next is, I'll take all of the notes that I've taken from our conversation, I'll put it together in a fee outline for you, and I'll give you a call to, uh, over the next couple of days to go through that with you. What would be a good day for us to do that? Would you prefer tomorrow, or would you prefer later on in the week? Oh, later on in the week. Okay, Friday morning, okay? Yep, all right, no worries. Well, what if I give you a call on Friday at 10? We'll go through the fee outline, you'll have all the information that you'll need, and then we can you know, take you to the next step from there. How does that sound? Yep, that sounds great. So enrol is you are just enrolling them in the next step forward. It might be a major step forward or it might be a minor step forward. You might go back to them and present your fee outline and they might say something to you like, oh, I need to, um, 
you know, I need to go and check with someone or I need to go and do this or I need to think about it or, you know, whatever. So, okay, great. When would you like to continue the conversation? Oh, well, you know, next week. Okay, great. Tuesday work? Yep, all right, no worries. I'll put a note to give you a call Tuesday morning at 10 and we can work out what you want to do from there. How does that sound? Yep, that sounds great. Or um, you might get, well, okay, well, when would you like to continue the conversation? Oh, well, don't call me, I'll call you. Okay, well, when do you think that might be? Two weeks, a month? <laughs> oh, look, you know, give me three, you know, I'll call you in three weeks. Okay, so if for whatever reason I don't hear from you in three weeks, are you okay if I give you a, so three weeks from today is Monday the uh, 28th. If for whatever reason I don't hear from you um, by say that Monday or the Tuesday, are you okay if I check in with you on the Thursday? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, great. Well, I'll put a note here to give you a call Thursday at 10 um, and we can continue the conversation then. How does that sound? Yep, that sounds great. So either way, you've got a commitment. You either get a, you either get a major commitment or you get a micro commitment, but it's still a step forward. So what I'm gonna do now is share with you what happens if, um, if you get to a point where there has been some kind of disconnect in the follow-up process. So um, what's interesting is that I, I did some work, this is actually a really interesting story. So there's a guy, um, do you remember Andy Smith from Mal's group? The tradie guy? I think I might have told you on the phone. Maybe. Anyway, he, he has a, a coaching group for trades businesses. So he's got, you know, um, builders, he's got electricians, uh, roller door companies, you know, all sorts of different type businesses. And he flew me over and I spoke to his group, very similar to what I'm doing right now. And I said to them, okay, so here's a scenario. Someone came, uh, someone inquired, you went out and saw them you gave them some sort of a fee outline or a quote, and they didn't commit on the spot, put your hand up if you follow them up once. So room full of 120 people, 30 hands go up. I've gone, put your hand up if you follow them up more than once. Not one hand went up. So I worked out, not on the spot because I'm not an athlete, um, sorry, a mathlete, um, I worked out later that at an average transaction size of $5,000, which would have been conservative for that room, at an average conversion rate of 20%, I worked out that there was $800,000 per month in unbanked sales sitting in that room, which is about 10 million a year. Crazy, crazy. So what I'm gonna share with you now is, is, the, is firstly some data, um, which it looks like um, John and Alan have actually uh, captured from the last session that I did, but we'll, yeah. re we'll revisit them. Someone. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Someone say they ripped you off. <laughs> it's called copyright. It's copyright. First it's all good. It's all good. I love it, actually. It's good. It's good that people are paying attention. Um, so, so I'm going to share with you some data around how leads are handled, and then I'm going to give you some specific dialogue, some specific templates, and some specific frameworks that you can use to follow people up in a professional way, in a proactive way, and in a low pressure way. Make sense? Yep. Cool. So um, what we know is that if you follow up web leads within five minutes, you're actually nine times more likely to convert them. I tested that. I, I, I saw that piece of data and I tested it with the RAC, who John mentioned earlier on, and they had a drop down menu where you, I think you had two four, four hour windows that you could choose to be contacted in. They took that off their drop-down menu on their web inquiry form and the call centre was instructed to simply call straight away as soon as they saw the lead. These guys record the calls and you can hear the excitement in the people who are being contacted. You know, they've literally pressed send or submit on the web form and suddenly the phone rings and they're just delighted. Like you can hear it in their voice. They're like, oh, oh, oh that was quick. Oh. I you know. hear that, absolutely. Yeah. We've been following up immediately as soon as one comes through during business hours, yep. unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just put that through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Calling people that. love it. It's, it's amazing the reaction you yeah. get. Yeah. I think people awesome. are expecting bad service because it's where the internet. Yeah. That's what yeah. we've experienced over the years. Yep. 
So they get a call straight away and it's like, wow. You're yeah. already right away. customer service yeah. that, that yeah. you must be a good and, and, and people, you know, we live in a world of instant gratification. You know, so people on some level want it now, you know, because of that's, that's the world that we live in. Um, so that works great, uh, as you've just heard. 80% um, of sales require five follow-up calls after the meeting and 44% of salespeople give up after one follow-up. So that is, that, that is quite bizarre and, and I can give you all sorts of different examples of, of what that looks like in a practical sense, but um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty telling piece of, 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 of data. Um, the average salesperson only makes two attempts to even reach a prospect. So often there are businesses out there that are getting large volumes of, of, of web inquiries, but they'll give up after a, a couple of attempts to even contact that web inquiry. So, you know, these represent big holes in the bucket in terms of conversion, in terms of maximising your investment in marketing. And, and if we can put steps in place, you know, we can create significant shifts by really not doing that much. You know, it's, it's not requiring a, lot, a whole lot of wizardry to simply try a couple of extra times to reach an inquiry. It doesn't require that much wizardry to, to follow up. I mean, you know, that it was interesting, you know, after the, the session I did at, that Rob attended last time, I, he said to me, oh, you know, I just got on the phone and just rang a whole bunch of people and, and straight away we made like, you know, three or four sales within two or three days, yeah. you know. And about five is is pretty on the money. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. You usually need about five off. Yeah. yeah. Um, 50% of sales go to the first salesperson to actually contact the prospect. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of dovetails into the whole nine times more likely to convert them if you call them within five minutes thing. 50% um, of customers will buy within 18 months, but only 15 to 20% will buy within the first 90 days. So this comes from some data that was collected from a company that does what they call did you buy campaigns. So what they'll do is that they will ring, so, so they're actually a, a, a web, a lead generation business, so they provide their clients with with certain amount of leads per month. But what they do as a, as a, like a kind of a quality assurance thing is that they will contact those leads and they will contact them every three months and they will say, did you buy, right? So you, you, know, you inquired with XYZ company about getting a fireplace. Um, there's a chance that you might have bought a fireplace from XYZ company but what they'll do is they'll keep ringing you every 90 days and say, look, we're not ringing to sell you anything. We just understand that you, that you were looking for a fireplace and we were curious if you actually did end up going ahead and buying one. So the data tells them that 50% that of people will actually make a purchase from someone within 18 months, but only 15 to 20% on average will actually buy in the first 90 days. So there's, there's a lot, because most people think the long game of follow-up is 90 days, but there's actually a lot more people that are going to make a purchase within the 90-day period and the 18-month period. And I've tested this um, with, re with lead re-engagement strategies um, on curtains, new home sales, um, my own database, I've done it a whole bunch of times. And it's, it's, like this, it's like you've got a big school of fish and, and, and you've got every 90 days, there's a certain percent. So if you've got like 100 fish in a pond, it's like every 90 days, a certain percentage of those fish will come up to the top. And the re-engagement strategy is, is, is like you just put the scoop in and the ones that are actually up the top near the surface of the water will be the ones that you get. And then in 90 days time, you do that again, but there'll be a different percentage of those 100 fish that have come up to the surface. So it's, it's quite bizarre that the, the type of, of things that we can create just through doing this re-engagement strategy. So the guys at um, Web Brown Neves, we did this with, and their average transaction size is like 800 grand. And, we were, and what they do is if they get a lead, and they, they put together a set of plans and a quote for them, 
And if they don't convert, they get coded as there's like a no code, right? So no, there might one no might be um, no decided to uh, sell our home and buy an existing home. Another no might be no, we went with another builder. Another no might be no, we can't get finance. Another no might be no, we've decided to stay where we are. So we did this re-engagement strategy. They were able to generate 25 sales conversations. So 25 people jump back into a conversation about buying an $800,000 home that had been categorized as no. No, I decided to go with someone else. No, I decided to sell my home, buy an existing home. Guess what they had done? Absolutely nothing. But now, I mean, what could change? It's like, I get a good tax return, or I inherit some money, or I get a new job that pays a lot better, or I sold my business. You know, there's all sorts of different things that can change in someone's circumstances that can take them from a definitive no to, yeah, I'm still, in, I'm interested again. And that's happening with your clients as well. Mm -hmm. What's what, what, give me an example of instant? Oh, I my business. Yep. Yeah. So um, home inspections. People are contacting me in an immediate need. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten. Yep. Um, and it's uh, sale anywhere between uh, one to three weeks. Yep. Um, at, it stretches out to eight weeks if they're a really proactive sort of person. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had to be basically need me within three days. Whereas when I'm doing home constructions, it's exactly that, where it can be 18 months to two year uh, process when you're doing custom home. Yeah, and look, you know, it's, there's, it, there's, not, there's not that much, um, in terms of the process, it's pretty simple. You've got a database of people. Um, you know, it's an it's a email broadcast that's got a specific me me um, message on it, and there will be a certain percentage of people that will stick their hand up and go, yep, I'm interested. You know, so I, I did it with um, my database and I had a guy that I'd met like eight years prior at an event that I ran in Sydney who I hadn't spoken to once, hadn't received one email from him. He, um, he rang me and said, look, I need your help. And I said, well, and, and at that point I wasn't doing any, any East Coast travel. I said, look, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, I'm not coming to the East Coast. And he said, that's cool, I'll fly, I'll fly to Perth. And I went, okay. So the next day I received an email, hadn't even, had a, hadn't even taken through the process, hadn't told him how much it was going to cost, nothing. Next day I receive an email, I've booked my tickets. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I've gone, oh, okay, no worries. So, and I ended up seeing him on the 28th of December, which as a consultant is unheard of. No one wants to talk to you on the 28th of, of December. I spent two days with him. He flew here, put him up at the, at the Fraser Suites, and we went through and got his stuff all sorted. Guy had been on my database for eight years. And I did this re-engagement strategy. He's put his hand up and gone, yep, I need you. <laughs> Crazy. Um, cool. So what do these stats mean for us? And what are, what, what are one or two changes that you can make based on what we just, what, what we just talked about? So um, quick conversation with the person next to you. What are one or two quick changes you can make to your process based on what we just talked about? So I'll give you 30 seconds. Quick chat. Go. Okay, 10 seconds on that, 10 seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So. What is a change you could make to your process based on what we just talked about? Yeah, response time, yeah. Easy, easy to do. Great, who else? What is it to do? What's your response time? Depends what we're doing at the time. And you know what? <laughs> you know what? It, it can be, it, it can be, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, I need to ring them and have a sales conversation with them. No, you can ring them and just say, hey, just got your inquiry. Um, understand that now might not be the best time for us to talk about this, but just wanted to let you know that I have, ha have, have received your inquiry and organise a time for us to have a longer chat about this. When would that be? When would be a good time for us to do that? If you just do that alone, that that can make a massive difference. Um, who else? One change that you could make. Yes. Actually, there's there's. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, a, there's the, the digital re-engagement strategy, but then there's also a telephone one that works really well. So it's always the first thing I do with a new client is that, because it can you know, help them to essentially take care of the investment in, in my program like straight away, is we do this re-engagement strategy and create some quick wins through people who have already inquired. So yeah, that's a, that's a ripper. Really good. Great. Yep. I think what we what we need to do, and this is from last month as well as today, is uh, react quicker to people that make inquiries after hours. Because people it. are doing all their research after hours often these days. They might not, you know, fill in a form on the website. Yep. No one's reacting straight away. We need some sort of automated response or um, chatbot, as our previous man sort of suggested. But yep. we're looking into it. But that's I think something that we could do to certainly improve those. Things. Yeah. Be the first person. Yeah, because you know what, in, in your business, what, what I've noticed, because I've had you know, a few conversations with people that do what you do, because it is such a necessity, there isn't a lot of pain out there. You know what I mean? Like there's a pretty steady flow of business to most people who have got some sort of an IT type business. So they, they, they do tend to be a little bit lax with that. So if you can get good at it, you will create a big strategic advantage in, in, terms, of, in terms of your competitors. For sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, the templates. So you can get these templates from my website, um, which is uh, if you just do a Google search for John Blake Sales, I will come up. And there is a book that I wrote called How to Follow Up Without Being a Stalker. And it has these templates in it. So you can feel free to take shots with your phone or make notes or do whatever you need to do. But if you go to my website, you can get the book. Um, it's got a, I think it's got like a, it's a yellow cover and it's got like a bag of money with a dollar sign on it. Um, and it's called How to Follow Up Without Being, Without Being a Stalker. So uh, I'm gonna go through these with you, but if you need to get the info, um, I just wanna let you know that there's a couple of different places. Right. So you don't get, yeah. This is follow up by phone. It's both. So I'm gonna share the voicemail template and the email template, and then I'm going to give you the exact structure that you can use per week over a seven-week period uh, so that you know exactly when to call and exactly when to email. Um, but most importantly, it's designed to work in a way that won't annoy the person. Right? So the whole reason that I came up with this is that when I first started this business 14 years ago, my background was action sports. So I was a competitive surfer. I was sponsored by Ripco and Quicksilver. And I had a whole bunch of, and, and I'd worked in the action sports industry for 17 years. So I'd worked, I was the agent for Mambo. I'd sold um, Havianas, electric sunglasses, Arnett sunglasses, Mambo, um, sorry, Mossimo, Mooks, a whole bunch of different brands that I had contacts with. So for the first five years of, of my consulting business, I had this warm list of people that were like, hey, you know, come and help us with our sales guys. That'd be great. You know, I worked with uh, Cotton On, Rip Curl, the, you know, with their retail. So I just had all of these existing warm leads that I could go to. But after about five years, we sort of got to the bottom of that list. 
And we were like, okay, now what are we going to do now? So whenever we got a lead, it was so valuable to us, we had to be able to really nurture that lead so that when they were ready to buy, we were there, but, but so as also not to piss them off so much along the way that they blocked our call and <laughs> took out an AVO on us. So that was how I developed this. It was really out of necessity, you know, during those early, those early years. So um, this is a voicemail template. So hi, the per person's name. This is you from your company. I'm coming back to you from earlier in the week or last week or whenever it was that you chatted. If we don't connect in between now and the end of the week, I'll try you again next week, my number is. Now, um, specifically around the language, why do you think I would suggest that you say, I'm coming back to you? So there's a very deliberate use of the, of, of the phrase, I'm coming back to you. So you don't sound like you're cold calling. Yes, so you don't sound like you're cold calling. Why else? What else is implied? I'm coming is back to you. Is this a cold call or have you had? No, no, no. This is someone who's inquired yeah. that hasn't done anything yet yeah. and, and it's just your follow-up system, right? You're just referring that you've already had a relationship. Yep, yeah. you're reminding them that there's already a relationship there. What else is implied by I'm coming back to you? You promised them that you... Yes, there's an obligation. There's an obligation. I'm obliged to come back to you because there is an obligation, yeah. right? Um, why would I suggest that you say I'm coming back to you as opposed to I'm following up? What type of people follow up? Salespeople. Correct. So there's a negative connotation to the use of the phrase follow up. So if you can eliminate, if you can eliminate follow up from your sales language, that would be a good thing to, for you to do. I'm coming back to you. A lot, a lot more elegant. Friendly. Friendly, yeah. And the other cool thing is that I'm coming back to you some people have that many telephone conversations, they can't remember who they rang and who rang them. So they might even think that you're actually returning their call, which would be even better, <laughs> right? Um, and so what you're also saying there is if, if, uh, if we don't connect, if we don't connect in between now and the end of the week, I'll try you again next week. So what you're saying is that if we don't connect, if, if they don't return your call, or if you don't try them again, or if, or, or if you don't talk to them again. So there's, there's some ambiguity around you know, who's, who's going to make the, 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 the contact. But regardless of that, if we don't connect, and, and, and the other ambiguity is we might connect via email. Right? But, but regardless, if we don't connect in between now and the end of the week, I'll try you again next week. So what does the person now know? That you've got a contact. Yes. Um, the other thing to, to um, remember here is never allude to the fact, so you can use this week in, week out. Never allude to the fact that the person hasn't called you back. Never allude to the fact that you might be pissed off that they haven't actually got back to you. Um, and when you do talk to them, pretend like you just spoke to them yesterday, even if it was like two months ago. <laughs> the interesting thing with this is that they've got the option to come back and say, no, don't worry about it. Correct. The conversation. Correct. But why they keep it open, they might, they're actually giving you permission And the same with the email, right? So, um, so what I typically recommend is that, is that you send this email out straight after you've called them, that way you don't forget to do it. Um, some people will wait a couple of days and then send the email out. Uh, so, hi, uh, uh, persons, uh, you were away from your desk or you, you were unavailable or you were in a meeting when I called earlier on in the week to touch base with regard to your whatever it is that they inquired with you about. If we don't connect in between now and the end of the week, I'll try you again next week, have a great weekend. So uh, when you start a communication with the word you, you will get a much higher response. In fact, uh, there's a guy called Evan Pagan who is a, a, a copywriter. Uh, he actually sells a dating product, so dating advice. And he did an analysis and found out that, the, that there was a direct relationship to the number of times the word you was used in an email and the response that he got. So when you start a communication with the word you, you will notice that, the, that you will get a, a, a much higher response. Um, so that's the email template, and then this is the schedule. So uh, within, within the first week of the last time that you actually had contact with the person, try them a couple of times. Uh, week two, if you still haven't heard from them, give them a call on the Tuesday 
and then e email them on the Thursday or just email them straight after, which is what I tend to do right now. Week three, repeat. Week four, repeat. Week five and six, uh, do nothing. So no email, no voicemail. And week seven, start again. Now, if you actually do talk to them in week two, then obviously you don't need to do that. <laughs> Some people ask me that, right? Um, and so if you, know, if, if you talk to them and they say, look, I'm not ready to do anything yet, so great, when would you like to continue the conversation? They might say, oh, give me a call in two weeks. You just put a note in your diary for two weeks' time. Don't email them and call them in the meantime. It's kind of rad that I need to quite clarify that, but I, I do get a few people that ask. Um, so, th so, so the other thing that's happening here is so you're calling them on a Tuesday and then in between the next telephone, com the, the, the next telephone attempt, You've got a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then another weekday. So when you put a weekend in between telephone contact, you, you tend to reset the tension that's built up that happens if you, you know, just cable guy out on someone and keep calling them like every day. So you tend to reset that, that, um, you know, that thing. And, and then you put that, that Monday in between as well so what that'll mean is that, you're, is that you're being proactive, you're being consistent, and you're being proactive, but you're not, you're not doing it to a level that's going to piss the person off. You don't look desperate. No, you don't look desperate. You're just being systematic. You're just being systematic. John, if you're not getting the response to the email or your voicemail messages, I mean, what, what's the logic behind that? Because it's not like you're feeling that you're harassing someone mm -hmm. or you're just following up. And well, um, I, I would, I, I, if you use this, you will get a response because here's the thing. The person, most people, or perhaps not most, but a large percentage of people don't like saying no to people. I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable ringing you and saying, no, I'm, I've decided not to go with you. So that's why you're sending an email as well because it gives them an easy way to say no, right? And it might sound weird that I'm preempting the fact that you should try and get a no. Well, here's the thing. A no is infinitely better than a maybe. A maybe will drive you insane. A no you can take to the bank. When I say take it to the bank, I, what I mean is if you know that you're putting 10 grand into marketing and you know that it's generating 50 leads and you know that out of that 50 leads, you're getting 25 yeses and 25 noes, well, that, you can build a business on that. If you're getting 50 leads and you're getting 25 yeses and 25 maybes, that's going to drive you insane. You can't plan a business. You can't grow a business on that. So getting a no is better than getting a maybe. So, so what's, you know, wh where's the line? And I, and I typically do this. I say, well, okay, you've got... That first, that first 90 days, if you use this, you should get some type of definitive answer within that first seven weeks. If not, you can just repeat it. Okay, so you've got, so this is, so this is 90 days. Um, then you've got between you know, let's say 18 months. So this, you can use those templates. Um, and then what you can do here, so I've actually got a couple of different ways. There's the, there's the um, email, re-engagement. And that's cool because it's like automated. Um, then there's also the um, gone dark email, which I'll share with you in a sec. So the, God, the gone dark email is good because um, it is, uh, it's just a standard template. The, the email re-engagement re strategy needs to be actually specifically done for your particular business, so I can't really kind of share that with you. Um, and then there's also a phone re-engagement strategy as well.
that you can use. And you can, you know, sort of cycle those along. So you've always got a way of re-engaging people when they're ready. Because in most cases, the reason, you know, the biggest reason that we, we tell ourselves as to why someone hasn't gotten back to us is what, do you think? What's the biggest reason we tell ourselves that a person hasn't come back to us? That they've gone somewhere else, yep, yeah. or? They don't like that, Or they don't like, us. yes. <laughs> they don't like me. Yeah. What about the response? Take it personally. Yeah, but in most cases, it's not about that. It's well, just not. What about the response you get from the client that you've actually awakened them up to the fact that they're training unconsciously non-compliant? Yep. And, and my business moves into unconscious compliance. Yep. So you present everything and then they say, look, thanks for that. Um, but we're, go we're going to look at all the different options. Mm -hmm. So I've kept following up with them, see how they're going, see if they, and it's still just ticking along. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, it, once they say that, you still follow up with them, you're not sort of stalking them. Sure. Yeah. Bad. yeah. Just, just g giving you a call to see how you're going with your decision making process. Um, in most cases, if you're hearing that, it's because they, have, that they haven't. There's not enough, um, they don't perceive enough cost of inaction. Yes. So, so in, mo in most that cases, that I want to work on is yeah. That, that, yeah. Um, getting that outweighing. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in that moment, you know, in, in that cost of inaction moment, another question that we often add is so 12 months' time you do nothing, tell me what that looks like. <laughs> you know, so they've just told you how crap their situation is, and then, and then you say, okay, so 12 months', t 12 months time, you do nothing, you just keep doing everything that you've been doing, tell me what that looks like. Because at that point, what you really want to hear, and, and, and if, if, it's, you know, if, if what's happening is working, what you will hear is, well, look, that's no longer an option. I need to address this, I need to do something about it now. Yeah, John, can you a bit different to um, um, the type of business you're running or based on the product or service you're running? Would this vary according to that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the people I work with, we build it specifically for them. So some people have a two-step process. Some people have, you know, there's a certain amount of this that happens on the phone before we actually meet them. Then there's the on-site session. And then there's the going back and presenting an, an actual proposal to them. It just depends on what you're, what, what you're selling. So what, what, what's your business? Accounting practice, got it. So big thing for accounting practices at the moment is that they all want to take their business clients from compliance to advice, but very few of them can do it at all. They all want to do it. They understand what they, what, you know, what, what they want, but they don't know how to do it. So I'm helping a lot of accounting businesses to do that because they understand that the compliance thing, the days are numbered. You know, it's becoming commoditized, it's boring, there's, no, there's not a big margin in it because there's downward pressure on, on, on the fees that you can charge for it. Um, accounts have got lots of, of knowledge. They can give great advice, but they don't know how to charge for it. They don't know how to put a framework in place that they can actually you know, get, get paid well for it. Um, so the, ah, the gone dark email. Okay? So this is one that you can use when you just haven't heard anything. So they haven't responded to your emails. They haven't responded to your voicemail messages, um, and for all intents and purposes, you know they've disappeared. Or I, th I think I think the dating term is um, they've you've been ghosted. <laughs> they've ghosted you. Uh, so this is the guy the, the guy on dark email. Rob, I'm writing the follow up on the message I left at your office and the email I sent you two weeks ago. I'm doing some planning for the next three months' projects. I'm in the process of closing files for the quarter. Typically, typically, when we submit a proposal and haven't heard back after two months, it means that they're really busy or they aren't interested. And, and insert you know, whatever number you want in there. You know, it could be three months, four months, whatever. Um, if you aren't interested, do I have permission to close your file? If you are, what do you recommend as the next step? Thanks for your help and then your name. So this is one that I actually sent to someone um, and that was the response I got. So this was a guy, every now and then you'll get somebody who will just get you to put in a, pro in a proposal so that they can get a government grant and then they'll just use the money for something else. Um, and I could tell that that was what this particular gentleman did and it annoyed me. <laughs> so I, 
I thought, you know what, I'm going to use the gone dark email on this guy and I'm going to get a response and then I'm going to use it in every workshop that I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Does he work for the government No, he doesn't. Um, uh, so this was his response, which is all bullshit, but anyway. <laughs> At least I got a response out of him. Recently I did a similar thing. They, we had some trucks for sale. So we put that out on LinkedIn, maybe. Oh, yeah. And then a uh, flurry of emails came from contractors on the east coast wanting pricing. Gave it to them really quickly. So then I saw about your, your network, I suppose, and then I heard that there's a, another fleet of trucks to be built for sale. Mm -hmm. And secondhand, they're only a year old. So this is gauging from, well, they were all gauging from me on a market price versus second, second and what they should offer or how much. Ah, so they were just, yeah, testing. Plain, yep. It happens. It happens. There's only 10 dishonest people in the entire world. They just travel around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, yeah. So look, you know, with all of that, I'm I'm uh, I'm confident that you will be able to plug some of these holes that you've got in your conversion bucket. I have certainly had lots of people who have been able to implement a lot of this and and make that happen. Um, the as I said on my website, the actual book is called How to Follow Up Without Being a Stalker. The reason that this one says how to increase sales using proven follow-up strategies is I did this presentation for Bank West and at the 11th hour I got a bit nervous that follow-up without being a stalker might be a bit strong for the bank. <laughs> so, I, so I had to sort of just like change it a little bit <laughs> to make it more palatable. Um, what was that? Uh, for Bank West? Ah, oh, look, you know what? I, it, I just... Didn't, you know, I, the, the presentation went well. There was like 150 people in the room. There was like 300 people online. Um, it was just a, you know, I guess a risk management thing. But I haven't changed it on my website. <laughs> it's still the same. Because it's, it's the biggest, one of the biggest questions I get asked. You know, it's like how much is too much? You know, how much, at, at what point, you know, do people start to feel weird? And, and I've, you know, continually tested that. Because, you know, like, as I said, you know, back when I first started this business. So I was in a, in a position where I had to be, I had to follow these leads through because I just wasn't getting that many of them. You know? I, was, I was just wondering if there's 150 people in that room, if you had the more controversial. The stalker one, yeah. Would they remember you more? Maybe, Sorry, I just, maybe, I just, uh, yeah. maybe. And you know what, they, they didn't ask me, I, you know, I self-censored yeah. that, you know. They didn't say to me, oh, you know, the stalker things. I just sensed the, the um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the client just sort of read the play and thought, oh, you know, I better, yeah. I better do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Politically. Correct, yeah. The, the thing that I'm, I'm feeling here is that my business is following a lot of those things, those formulas you're talking about. Mm -hmm. For me, it's making me feel like, it's giving me a lot more confidence because you do as a business owner think they're not following up product shit, I'm crap, they don't like me, all that sort of thing. Yeah. But knowing that there's a formula that, that we are following and we're no different to any other business is actually gives confidence. Yeah. As long as you're consistent and you know that, you know, what you're doing is 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 you know has has got a a rhythm to it so that at the end of the year you'll know and can be confident that you haven't wasted any opportunities. Because you know there's always going to be a certain percentage of people who will buy, there's always going to be a certain percentage of people who will wait and then buy, and then there will be a certain percentage of people who will never buy. You know, I have, I have literally got people on my database that have been there for, because I've been doing this now for 14 years, that have been on my database for 14 years who have never done anything. And I know that there's a really good chance that they never will. <laughs> Maybe. If, 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 if you keep in contact with them, your leads could be coming with the Who knows? Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah, you know, people go, oh yeah, um, you know, such and such said that I should contact you. And I'm like, who's that? <laughs> I'm getting referred, to, referred by people who I've never met. So. Is there a different process for specification selling? 
because uh, the web assignment likes to get things specified. Yes. So is there a different process <coughs> than device guidance and changes to the uh, approach? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, and in most cases, um, so Simon is, I got it. So, so what's your business? And I was WA. So essentially it's a window and the SAR finishing. Got it. Got it. So, so, so that, that, that's more of a, an education slash influence piece on the people who have got the influence, right? Yeah. So at the moment I'm working, in fact the meeting I've got later on today is with an electrical contractor. And what, what they are dealing with is a lot of downward pressure on price. You know, everything's price, 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 price. But what they identified is that the, the, the people with the majority of influence in the process are what are called these um, consultants, right? So electrical um, engineering consultants that are advising the actual client on who they should go with. So what, what we did is we put together a way that we could support the consultants that would create some reciprocity so that the consultants would be more likely to recommend my client who is the, the electrical contractor. Um, and it was, it's actually worked really well because what happens is that the consultant will see like a particular you know, proposal or a, you know, a set of specifications for a particular job and what they lack is the practical application. So something might look really good on paper, you know, it's, it's the age old argument between the architect and the builder. You know, the architect says, well, this will work. And the builder says, uh, nah, sorry, mate, you haven't considered the, the practical aspect of this. So what my client's doing, because they're, they're essentially the builder in this, in this equation, is that they're going to the consultant and saying, hey, happy to, you know, we'll, we'll run our eyes over your best guess at this to make sure that you haven't missed anything so you don't end up with egg on your face from your client in the form of some, some kind of um, revision or some sort of variation, I think is the, is, is the actual word, um, you know, when the thing goes to site. So we're helping you to look good and avoid looking bad to your client. And as a result of that, the reciprocity factor is, okay, well, yeah, well, you know, we recommend these guys because they make our life better. So the, the, the real question is who has the majority of influence in the decision making process and what can you do to help them to, um, to look good or as if not more importantly, avoid looking bad in the process. That help? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So that's, that's pretty much me. Done and dusted. I hope it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure.